kind of get into coaching they want to become you know four coaches etc and it's really yeah. trying to infuse people to to build their own their own pool of players from juniors and sort of grow grow people to maybe a level where they do go to the states or you know yeah. grow an academy really so i just wanted to kind of to get you on because obviously you run a really successful academy in sharpshooters you've branched out to you know numerous numerous venues and you're doing really well yeah. it's just really to get your insight on how you've gone about it kind of good things about it obviously negatives about it as well just really yeah. getting an overview on what why you think if you do think that more people should get into into junior golf coaching really so what are your thoughts on that um i mean there's so many strands to it isn't there um I suppose, I mean, I've personally have always been to junior golf clubs because I went through the process of it myself and I really enjoyed it. Um, like being a junior member of the club, progressing through, you know, getting to connect with uh, adult members as well. Um, so to try and give, it's, it's great to be able to try and give children that maybe are trying golf for the first time that introduction and that opportunity to kind of, uh experience what you've experienced and you kind of want to pass that on to someone um so that's that's a big thing i think um that you you know it's be able to or for me was be able to pass that on one um to someone else and hopefully they take into golf which maybe they wouldn't have done otherwise yeah introducing people that haven't necessarily would never have had access to the game so to speak yeah yeah how did you um how did Sharpshooters start then? What was the what was the thoughts behind it? Obviously, the branding's really good. It's really strong. What was your... Yeah, I know you said you've done junior coaching. What made you kind of start a Bespoke Academy? Um, I, th- I wanted to create something. I suppose I looked around and wanted to kind of create that group experience uh, for children uh, because golf being an individual sport, um, you know, it's, if you go and just do it on your own from day one, um, you're not fully experiencing everything about golf and golf as much as it's individual sport. It's about mixing with other people that you may not have you know, mixed with before. And, um, we wanted to get into group coaching and, you know, build an academy as such or the Sharpshooter Academy to have that kind of community that children could be part of. So they could be part of something. Um, and also something that parents could buy into and understand what they're sending their children off to. Um, and sharpshooters kind of come about just, um, we wanted to kind of hopefully come up with something kind of, uh, not traditional, um, and something that sounded exciting, something that sounded fun that kids would want to be, oh, I'm part of the sharpshooters Academy. Um, and again, I didn't want to put my name to it, um, because it only works for one person then. And I wanted to kind of take myself out of it and just have an, a, the academy behind it. Hard, isn't it? When you, when you have, you know, you build it up. Yes, you're right in terms of having a name that's not not your own. Um, it's difficult though, isn't it, when you do, because you're the one running sessions. We have the same, we have the same kind of conundrum, especially in the, in its infancy. You know, they come and see, they come and see Paul, don't they, for their golf. It's getting, it's getting as a business, it's getting away from that, isn't it? And yeah. not solely relying on yourself, particularly to grow, I guess. You've got to have other people doing it for you and, mm. and growing the name for you as well, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, you definitely got to. Well, depending on what you're, a lot of co- coaches are, you know, are happy to just to, um, you know, if, if, the, if it's their thing and they want to teach uh, just for themselves and it's their own academy and they're doing it, everything's hands on, then great. Um, you know, and you might be fully, um, fully ready for that because you're going to do you're going to do all the admin, do all the coaching, all the communication yourself and the advertising, um, and that might just be right. I'm hands on. Everything is delivered by me and controlled by me. So if something either goes wrong or goes well, I get the pluses and minuses from it. Um, but uh, from our side, I wanted to kind of take um, it a step further. And then reach more people. And to do that, uh, we've had to bring in other coaches or look to bring in other coaches um, to support that and be able to deliver that as well. How have you found um, the growth side of things? So obviously, you ran a, a really good academy in our area, didn't you? Really, like, say, fairly recently, you're still local now. 
how did you go about like branching out and and stranding it in terms of I mean, are you is it in set? You're in seven centres now. Is that correct, or have I got that wrong? Yeah, no, we're in we're in quite a few now, and it's just a lot of it's been through word of mouth. Um, obviously, I think the advertising is a big part of it. Not that we advertise that, um, you know, we're looking for golf clubs, but we advertise well we have we advertise what we do and what we deliver um and then communicating with clubs and coaches that are you know so junior golf friendly as such um and that could be through various ways it might be through instagram it might be through uh friendly matches it could be through golf sixes um us kids tournaments that we run um and we get to know the clubs the pros the coaches through that way and then you soon end up finding that either those guys then start saying oh we're missing we haven't got a junior section or we'd really like to build up a junior section and it's something then we've gone well you know that might be something that we can support you and help you with um on a hands-on basis um so and that's probably where we've kind of built from probably from sort of us more so recommendation really um rather than anything else you find out of a lot of camp bookings and, and stuff as well. It's a yes, you advertise as we do, but it's your biggest form of advertising is people, your own client base, and they they spread the word for you in terms of their kids have had positive experiences, they've enjoyed the camps, they've enjoyed the weekly coaching. Do you still find word of mouth being your biggest biggest form of positive advertising? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, obviously, we we email parents and communicate with parents a lot um, on a yep. weekly basis. Um, uh, but at the same time, yeah, the majority of, you know, outside of lessons, camps will come, majority will come from uh, academy golfers. And then then you tend to find that there's a feed on into sort of new golfers from there. That they're, like you said, um, their friends, they bring along their friends, you know, and then they introduce them. And then it's like that stepping stones. They then start hopefully then coming along to the next lesson. Absolutely. It starts stranding and rolling over from there, doesn't yeah. it? Definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Similar sort of questions, but if you were at a venue now, let's just say you started over again, yeah, you want to get into junior golf coaching, you're not really sure, well, with the experience you've got now, but you wouldn't be really sure what to do. What would you, how would you go about it now if you were starting from absolutely zero? So there might be a, a professional listening to this that wants to do more junior coaching, wants to build an academy. Where would you tell them to go and kind of start focusing their energy? Um. I think you, if you can get, obviously, I'm just, that's under under the assumption the club's right behind you, which I'm sure they would be. You know, yeah, yeah. There's a, you've obviously got the members there and they're probably their grandchildren want to get involved and be part of that. Um, or parents have got their children, parents that are members of the club. Um, that's obviously your first point of call. Um, and then from there, it's literally going straight off to schools. Um, most, we've had best experience with primary schools. So if you go to, go into primary schools, you know, and then you've got so many avenues of kind of advertising from there you've got by do you go and deliver something f for them at the school? Um, are the school happy to send out your, maybe your advertising you're going to do, you're going to do with the golf club. Um, but you need that, you need to go and reach to the local schools. Um, you don't need a lot, two or three just to get started because you're better off Um getting strong connections with two or three schools and you are trying to reach 50 schools and just kind of whizzing past them. Um, if you can get strong connections, then, then they'll stick with you because the biggest thing for schools is that they want consistency. And if they know that someone's reliable, um, whether it be a golf coach, tennis coach, uh, football coach, um, if they know you're going to come in, you're going to deliver what you say you're going to deliver um, or commit to what you're going to, you've offered to them, that makes their job million times easier um and then you're off and running and they'll they'll just keep ticking over you again and again and again yeah you're absolutely right it's, it's not a it's not a six-week term and you're done is it it's a it's a relationship formed over a number of a number yeah, of it, years it's really. definitely not um junior golf is definitely not um uh, a, a quick turnaround it's a slow burner um but if you if you if you work it right it can be you know, a very big slow burn. And if, you, if you're at that club for a year, two years, five years, 10 years, um, you can make a really strong, powerful academy there. Absolutely. Going back in, going back into schools then, um, 
I know we've all been doing it for a long time now. Do you still enjoy going in, delivering sort of baseline golf sessions to, to big groups of, of kids? Is that still something you get a real buzz out of? Do you prefer, I know you probably like doing all of it, but is that still something you really have a passion for, for delivering yourself at the moment? Yeah, it's good fun. It's, um, you, you go in there, you, I mean, you'll get, when you go and do it, you'll get a chunk of kids that will love it and be like, oh my God, this was amazing. Um, and I want to get into golf. You'll have a, a, a number of kids that go, that was fun as well. Um, but that's fine for me. And that's, you always get some kids have got no interest in golf because obviously <laughs> you're going in and you're talking to kids that have never maybe even thought about it before. And that's the plus side. Hopefully you've got, there'll be some kids that you go, okay, so you play golf. Why don't you, you know, come to our club because we're really proactive. But you also have some kids there who've never thought of golf before and you're introducing them to that new sport that maybe they've never thought about or had the opportunity to go and try. But like you said, also there's going to be some kids there who go, no, it's not for me it's whatsoever. Fine, no problem at all. But it is, a lot of it's all to do with just the numbers game. You know, you do it enough times to, a, you know, enough a big enough population, your conversion rate's going to come back anyway, assuming you're delivering, a, you know, a good product. Um, in terms of, going into a school I, I spoke, spoke to a lot of sort of coaches that are sort of going through their PGA or um, have just qualified and they're looking to deliver more school stuff and I think they're very kind of a lot of them are very they're, they're good at getting maybe getting into a school and getting that first link but they're not great at you know I say selling themselves really in terms of flyers adverts I mean we go in to every school we go to and fly for pretty much every child to take away People think that's going to cost you bundles of money. It's not. You just have to get a nice generic flyer to be able to hand out. Is that is that kind of the way you go as well? Volume. Yeah, you like just got yeah. Flyers. Um, black and white. You know, just keep it to the point. Um, it doesn't need to be. Obviously, we have some flyers that are, you know, if um quite colourful and it's got the the um everything on there. But if it's your first introduction, and it's a simple black and white flyer, as long as it's got the text on there and what you're offering that's that's more than good enough because again you know who you're delivering that to you know that, that they just need the nuts and bolts to start with and if if you're offering something that sounds interesting that sounds appealing to them that's and like you said to keep the cost down you, you really to do it on mass you can't you can if you want but in terms of a cost perspective you know it's much easier doing black and white and just you know send to all the kids as best as possible and even some schools will even go you actually don't worry about the paper flyers. We'll send it out via email. PDF, yeah. As long as you've got a PDF version, then you're going to send it out to everyone anyway. So it's, it's getting that it's getting that big outreach about a massive outlay, isn't it? I mean, you've only got to get several, well, a little a little amount of flyers done. Keep it nice and simple, so you can you can kind of generate them on mass when you when as and when you need to. And it's just your outlay for some some equipment isn't it to get into a school yeah. it's not people think it's going to cost bundles but it doesn't initially and then you know that even um uh in terms of you talk about cost of uh equipment you know if you speak to the golf foundation um generally they'll fund you for some, for some kit so it won't cost you anything to get the kit um and even you go a step further even some schools will have kit on site so you know depending on how um how good your connection with them is they'll provide they can provide some kit for you but i would always then if you know like i said first step you've gone into a school and you've got zero kit um i would then get into and you didn't want to spend anything i'd go and get in touch with the golf foundation um and they'll provide you some funding to be able to get the kit that you need yeah definitely you're absolutely right so looking at okay we, we, we've touched on schools i'm a junior now i've gone to some of the sessions at a school love it I've had a flyer for I want to go and I want to go and experience golf at an external facility with yourself. How do you make the transition from a school setting where a junior is, you know, you're going into their into their kind of comfort zone, really, into their school, their surroundings? How do you make the transition from school to the golf club as seamless as as possible? Um, you just got to make sure that all your communication beforehand um, is really clear and consistent. So before the parents even turn up, they know where they're going to meet the coach. Um, they know what their expectations are as the parents, whether they're going to be watching in the lessons or they're going to be waiting in the clubhouse. Um, 
let them know that they've got you know we've got the all the equipment ready so you know these children can turn up obviously haven't probably haven't bought any clubs so you can provide the clubs if you can um and then just giving them as best an outline as possible prior to the session so when they turn up they're fully prepared and ready of what's going to happen um and then off you go obviously depending on what facility you've got then you can you know do what you do what you can or do, do what you enjoy doing to be able to give those children that really good first experience at the golf club yes i think a lot of coaches don't they get bogged down with oh this junior's got to go away with correct grip correct aim correct setup straight mm -hmm. away in their development and it's it's really not like that, is it? You've got to get them to love the game. Well, us, we certainly, and you do, certainly get them to, obviously you're going to give them technical stuff to do to make them better at hitting the golf ball. But they've got to, you can do that once they actually want to be there and enjoy, you know, it's enjoying the game first, isn't it? Getting them there. And then you can start mm. to feed in some technical, technical detail as and when, not at the, not at the detriment of their enjoyment, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, they've... um yeah, I think if you went in there and kind of try to teach all the mechanics of the golf game, you're probably gonna the lessons gonna last about five minutes and they're gonna go back indoors. Um, but I think if you can, um, like you said, it's the activities. What's yet? The, uh, they've got to be fun activities, games, competitions. Um, you know, that child's highlight of the day might be going back into the clubhouse afterwards, getting a cookie and sitting down with granddad, telling them about what he's been up to. That could be the, the what the bit that he's most or he or she's most looking forward to, um, but if you can create some fun games that are there where there are a bit of competition, some of the kids like, um, like you said, down the line, you start dripping in sort of the technical side for it. But again, that's obviously depend on who you've got in front of you. It's it's almost secondary at the start, isn't it? Get them to love it first, yeah. and then. And yeah. you then you then talk to them, you talk to the parents, you talk to the children, and you kind of get an outline of what they want to do. Uh, we, we've got kids, you must have kids that you teach that just love st spending time shelling driver on the range, and you get them to want to do mm. a little bit of chipping, and it's it's like pulling teeth sometimes. Oh, the weather's nice, yeah. we need to do a little bit of this. But then it is, at, at the end of the day, it's their experience. They want to do, I guess they've got to fall in kind of into your ethos because they're at your, your academy, but... If they want to just hit balls on the range, there, there is a scope for them just hitting balls on the range, providing, as you say, you've communicated with the parents sufficiently. You know, yeah. if a parent wants to go in one direction and say, I want my, my little lad to be playing, you know, county golf in five years or what have you, and the lad and the and the, and the children, a child, sorry, wants to just bomb driver all the time, there has to, yeah, it, communication's massive, isn't it? Don't yeah. overpromise and don't um, don't kind of over overstate what, what they're going mm. to be doing, I guess. Yeah, it's just making sure, um, like you said, it depends what child. You might have a child there that you think is going to be on the path to a county golf, and they might just be there happy. Um, I like I like the TV behind me, the top tracer machine or whatever it is. And for me, that's that's what I want. Um, but what is your goal of that? Um, but also what is your par the parents' interpretation? And you've got three, three versions there, and you've got to try and tie up quite quickly. Because um, otherwise, you're going to be battling against each other all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, communication with that is absolutely, absolutely key. Um, just conscious of the time, take not too much of your time. But with no, with no, regards no. to, again, have this chat, I had a chat with a lot of professionals. They'll run some su successful stuff in the summer period, maybe done some camps, got a bit of traction off of them. Then they're looking at now, sort of September, going, well, where, how do I take this further? And we always have the discussion around, oh, my numbers were busy in, in the summer, but they dwindled down in the winter. I'm sure you're along the same quarter line of us in terms of monthly fees and people paying monthly gives you a regular income, whether you're in the middle of summer or, you know, in the depths of darkest winter. Is that something you'd strongly advocate for everyone to get to, get yourself a programme and get people used to paying monthly, monthly fees? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think if you're doing it otherwise, it's I think it's it's kind of old hat now. Uh, doing it differently, so you still see some people pay. Look, here's six lessons for the price of whatever it is for kids classes. But um, it's if you've got ten kids in your academy and that's it, then fine. This is probably easily man manageable. But if you want to, you know, have a reasonable income from it or some consistent income from it, uh, direct debits the way forward and that's the same with probably most sports academies you know gymnastics Absolutely. football 
everything's along direct debit. Um, and I think particularly golf, we get a bit caught up in what's more traditional and probably um, uh, what is kind of what we used to do. Whereas, you know, if you get consistent, like you said, come middle of summer or the middle of winter, if you're standing on the tee in, on, on the driving range and you've got a T-shirt on or you're in the middle of winter and it's chucking it down outside, at least you know you're still – you you've turned up, you've reserved the time for, for their class, you know, it should be a consistent income. Absolutely. And I think the quicker people kind of transition to that, as you quite rightly said, everything, you know, even bills at home, your internet, you don't pay for it when you use it. You pay for it if you use it or not. It's kind yeah. of one of those. It's getting, yeah, yeah, people are in that mindset anyway. But yeah, to coaches out there, definitely do it as so as quickly as possible. I mean, we still offer one kids club a week, our only roll up class of the week. But that is our feeder. That is our soft introduction to yeah. transitioning from schools to the club. And then you know, we don't cap that. That can be anything from eight to, to 20. And you get some parents there that say, oh, it's really busy. Like, is it always like this? You say, no, our other classes are pay monthly and, and the numbers are capped to a certain degree. So it, it kind of, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be running the whole business off of off no, of um, praying people turn up. Definitely not. It is difficult in that way. Yeah, yeah. As yeah, you said, getting yeah. away from traditional, being traditional, isn't it? You're six for five or one lesson free, it's, yeah, it can become, yeah. yeah, you get in that dinosaur mentality of what they were doing 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, and you want that, that commitment. You've, you know, if you're going to teach these children, um, you know, you want to put your best effort into them. Um, so you're committing to a program that this is how it's going to run. If you want to be part of that, then great. You'll have a lovely time and your children will improve their golf. Um, don't want to be part of that. No problem. I'm sure someone else does something differently. That's an interesting point, actually. Talking about people leaving or people coming to your academy from elsewhere. You know, we've all had it. People leave, people come back, people move to other people, which, you know, it's it's part and parcel of of sport at any at any level and any and any sport itself. How do you manage that in terms of right, do you look at it in the case of, right, I've lost one person in that group, I need to try and promote someone else into that group, or do you, what I'm saying is how do you approach people that, that leave? Do you have kind of like a policy to say they've got a month, got to give a month's notice? What's your kind of thoughts around people leaving and, and not getting too emotionally attached to them, basically? Yeah, no, I think, um, again, if you're doing it on the small numbers, if you just had a, a, you know, just one group of 10 and someone leaves, it's, it's probably you're kind of wondering why, you know, and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, if, if it's a real income that you want to focus on, um, you've just got to let it go. Because hope, hopefully that one person leaving, you should have four or five other people kind of either looking to sign up or sign up anyway. Mm-hmm. So it should be a, a minority. Um, and people will leave, you know, not because you're rubbish or they don't like you, but um, and that, but it may happen. Um, but it, probably most likely it's because another club that they do has changed days. Um they're going into a different school year. Um, it could be a, a number of things while they're, while they're leaving. So you've just got to let them go and focus on the new ones. Circumstances change with certain people, don't they? Yeah, and it's not yeah, it's not getting too too attached. You are you are no. it's that personal touch when you're giving the lessons, absolutely. But yeah, ultimately you're looking to fill to fill slots, definitely. Yeah. I and mean, obviously if, if they turn around and go, or oh, yeah, like you said, classes class size is a bit high or um you know, he's got friends in another class or he's, you know, um, he doesn't feel like, or he or she doesn't feel like they're mixing right in the class. And if there's something you can solve and they give you that feedback, then obviously you've got your opportunity to try and write, let's get on the phone, let's talk to them and see what we can do. Um, but if someone says, look, yeah, our, class, our, our school years have changed or, you know, uh, we're going to have to drop it for X reason. Uh, it is what it is. You just, okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you letting me know. Um, Let's move on because the sooner you move on from that, then you, the sooner you can bring someone else in that is going to be there then for a long time with you. Absolutely right. Right, last last couple of couple of points. Um, looking at you know growing a junior academy, um, you know the stuff that we put out on social media, the stuff you put out on social media. We've been doing it a long time. It's it's. I think a lot of people, a lot of coaches, kind of expect it's going to be instant success. Straight away, day one, I'm going to have 50 people in my academy. 
I just want to give people kind of the journey on your sort of journey for it. How long have you been doing it to get it to this point? You've been doing it probably longer than we have, really, by a couple of years. So how, kind of when did you start? What's the journey look like to get to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, we, we probably started it. Uh, I mean, we probably really started it probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, but like you said, it's it's not a quick turnaround. You can't expect people to turn up, open, you know, put out the flyers and you get 50 people, 100 people through the doors. Um, nice. <laughs> it would be lovely if you could do that. It would be lovely. Um, but it is just that slow burner. Um, and, you know, if you can put out, obviously you got to look at your diary and what, what's available and what, there's, you can't like, there's no point overstretching yourself and going like I'm here seven days a week and you know you can turn up at any time but if you can put out maybe advertise three four classes um and go right I'm going to schools that's let's say 40 children let's see if I can get 40 children um by the end of this term um then you've set your goal and you've got something to focus on and then you can build towards it um and that's as long as you're proactive and you and like you I think you said earlier, it's then it's easy. All of a sudden, it drops off. I know a couple of people leave, and you feel actually, is this going right? As long as you're following the plan of action that you've set out and how you're advertising people and you're consistent with it, uh, it will build. Because obviously, you know, we're all golf coaches, so we're all know how to deliver a class. Um, as long as you know that actually, I'm delivering it, I know it's a good class. It's just a case of reaching more kids. Then you just keep persevering with it and it will build. Scaling. As you said, I was waiting for you to say consistency. It's just being consistent with what, what you can offer. And yeah. then, yeah, as you say, not overstretching yourself, not promising the world. And if it doesn't fit within, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? You, you know, you want the income and someone said, I need eight o'clock on a Friday night. And you think, Oh, I don't really want to do it, but I've got to do it. It's being, it's yeah. being quite firm with yourself, isn't it? And regimented in. Yeah. That's what I'm going to stick towards. If it doesn't fall in line with what I need to do, that's fair enough. They can go kind of look elsewhere for for another solution. Yeah, which is yeah, yeah, it's hard at times, but it needs you. You're right; it needs to be done. Yeah, yeah. You just got to. St- but sometimes you might look and go, actually, I, I can adjust myself for, for that for that time slot, or I'm gonna I'll put it on a different day for some reason. Thursdays don't work here. Let's try Wednesdays. But you need to give it a go. You can't put out one flyer. You know, sit on the range and no one turns up and think, "Well, oh, that didn't work." Um, um, you you got to be consistent. You keep advertising, keep pushing, keep communicating. It's a lot of effort. Um, you know, the admin's probably more difficult or more time than the actual delivery of the lesson. That is an important um, thing to cover. I mean, I don't know about you, but admin is the the biggest bane of uh, of our lives as junior coach. And actually, a, a guy commented on one of our posts the other day saying you've got to factor in the admin, and I thought it's bang on. Actually, it does take up a lot of your time. But obviously, we're we're better at. I'd like to think I've got better at it over the years. Um, but we're kind of better at the delivery side of things. Have you outsourced any kind of admin stuff? I mean, do you do it all yourself? Do you have other people? What I'm trying to get is, you get to a scale, you need help. It's all well yeah. done. I'll do it myself. I'll keep, I'll keep that chunk of the pot. But actually, for your for your time, your yeah. family time, and your health, it's probably better sometimes to actually outsource these things and get them run in a better way than you trying to do absolutely everything. If you can, yeah, obviously it comes down to a cost, but then um, there's, I suppose, two ways of thinking of it. You can either, right, I'm, you know, I'll get home and I'll do my admin either up until 10 o'clock at night. Um, I allocate time during the day. Um, I get up in the mornings, do my admin time. Um, or if you've got you know friends, family um, that can help you out with admin time, uh, then obviously that makes it easier as well because then you can go off and do all delivery while someone else is, you know, knocking out the emails. Yes, it is. Imp- yeah, I suppose initially if you start on a smaller scale, do it in-house, do it yourself. And then once you get to a point where you think, I do need a little bit of help, hopefully you're financially a little bit more set and you can you can start to outsource these things, definitely. Yeah, I mean, there's myself and uh, my other half, Katie, she does all pretty much all the admin side um i do some of it but she does the vast majority of like the advertising the marketing the design work um but we've had to kind of manage that accordingly yeah it's difficult especially when you're juggling as you see juggling uh 
juggling little ones as well at home. It's difficult yeah. trying to fit yeah. admin time in at yeah. home. Yeah. Right, last thing before I let you go. Um, always try and ask people that come on the show two things. What's next for you? I know you've started some new, some really exciting things with your performance days, which look really good. So what's next for sort of sharpshooters and, and Paul in Golf Academy? Um, and then who should we try and get on the pod next? Tough one. Um, we, so instead of sharpshooters, we are uh, currently focusing on our competition side. So as well as the lessons, we're trying to make our what they call play day competitions. Um, uh, we're, we're running some of those at the moment through the winter because we want to make sure our juniors are playing as well as having the lessons and they've got their kind of end point to focus on or point to look forward to. Um, we're also running, we also run US Kids Junior Golf Tours. Um, so we we are oversee the London region um, and we've got like a North London, East London, West London, South London tours uh, where we have 50, 60 juniors come and compete and they can end up qualifying for national and international events. So they're, they're really busy at the moment. We do those most weekends. Um, and yeah, we've got the Junior Golf Performance Academy clinics that we run uh, throughout the year. Uh, these are like short days, um, very small classes, really focused on like um, competitive junior elite golfers, fine-tuning a couple of points. We've got one coming up at the Belfry uh, in November. Um, and then um, so that's really something we're really looking forward to. And in the new year, we've got our first winter training camp at the Tommy Fleetwood uh, Academy in Dubai. Uh, that's in February. So it's nonstop, busy, busy. Absolutely. And then who would I recommend to get on, on here next? Um, you've you've had a lot of the guys already. I would, I would jump to. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I said uh, Neil Plimmers was a really interesting one I heard. Um, he's, he's always great. good. For, yeah, he's a really interesting. Looks at things very differently. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. I'll have a think and I'll come back to you on it.